My name is Judy Campisi. I'm a professor at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. I'm a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I've been working on aging for more than 25 years, although I didn't start out doing that. And um, I think one of the most exciting things that has happened in the last five years or so has been this idea that we can make drugs that people can take that will eliminate cells that we know from mouse models can drive a lot of age-related diseases. Excellent. So what got you interested? What, what, uh, why was it Senolytics um, that got you what, what was it about analytics that got you interested what, what we discovered is a mechanism so you know scientists we live for mechanisms it was known and hypothesized for a long time that cells that were stressed or damaged so we call them senescent cells that those cells uh, have a role in driving aging but very little was known about what a senescent cell really is. Um, what we knew about senescent cells was that they stopped dividing. And somehow that was thought to have some role in aging. And what we discovered is it was not so simple. They not only stopped dividing, but they started secreting molecules that would then influence neighboring cells. And that's when we really began to realize that how they could drive many types of age-related diseases. And so we got very interested in studying that mechanism. And then we made a transgenic mouse, so totally artificial gene, that allowed us to make those cells go away, just die. And that mouse showed us that senescent cells do indeed drive a lot of age-related diseases. Now, we can't make transgenic humans, but the hope was that we would find drugs that would be able to do it. And we never actually discovered those drugs. Those drugs were discovered by other labs um, based on some of the findings in the transgenic mouse models. Did you have any idea when you were first um, doing the beginnings of this research how much of an impact it would have? No. No. I, I am a basic scientist, which means, you know, I live and die for getting at basic mechanisms. And the thought that that work is now probably going to be in people is exhilarating. It's, it's something, of course, I always hoped for, but I never really thought it would happen. So, as a basic scientist, of course, we always hope that what we do will be useful, but it seems so far removed. And the idea now that this foundation of work that we and other labs have contributed to that have given rise to these drugs that might help humans is exhilarating. It's, it's totally unexpected that it would happen so fast and so robustly, but it's, it's fantastic. So senolytics refers to a broad class of drugs. What they all have in common is uh, the ability to selectively target senescent cells compared to their non-senescent counterparts and get them to die. But the way they act can be quite different. They have different mechanisms of action. So for example, there are many, many genes that are encoded in our genome that determine whether a cell will live or die, actively live or die. And so some of these ones that cause cells to die are called pro-apitotic genes, and ones that cause cells to survive are anti-apitotic drugs, uh, genes. So we know that what senolytics can do if we target those anti-apitotic genes then what happens is senescent cells are less protected from cell death and they're more inclined to die. So that's one way in which um, senolytics can work. But there are other mechanisms. There are master um, proteins that program whole patterns of gene expression. And some of those proteins are transcription factors 
that are designed to turn on or off those genes that cause cell death or not. And so some of the senolytics target those transcription factors. And there are probably yet other mechanisms that we still don't completely understand. There are compounds that have been reported in the literature that selectively kill senescent cells, and we don't know how they act. We don't know their mechanism. So we have a lot more work to do. It's interesting that they've been called zombie cells. I, I don't know why they're called zombie cells. First of all, because they're making all of these proteins that they're secreting, they're very energetically active. Secondly, they're actually physically active. So we have done time-lapse cinematography to watch these cells under the microscope. They're running around. They're far from being zombie-like. And they, as I said, they also play really important good roles in certain biological processes like embryonic development and wound healing. So they're very far from being zombies, but they are different creatures from their non-senescent counterparts. They're quite different. Yeah, so it's not the sort of thing you can like in the, Holly, uh, in the Hollywood movies, just so shoot them between the eyes and they're gone, right? Right. It's a lot more complicated. That's right, that's right. It seems as though like, there's hundreds of millions of dollars now being invested in um, senolytic drugs at the moment, at least the research of them. Um, and it seems to, I think there'll be a lot more in, in, in the future. What, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I think it will have, I think the interest in developing senolytics has to go up for the following reasons. We don't know of a single senolytic that will eliminate every type of senescent cells. And we know there are many types of senescent cells. There are 200 cell types in your body. Those that can become senescent have their own profile. We know that senescent cells aren't always bad. Sometimes they're good. So there's going to be um, a lot of work that needs to be done to develop more specific drugs and better drugs. And I don't think that's going to let up in the near future. Well, what kinds of diseases can, um, do you think senolytics drugs will help to address in the future? We know the answer to that question. In, we know the answer to the question of what types of diseases senolytics can possibly benefit in mice. And the list is quite impressive. Everything from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease to kidney failure to osteoarthritis to um, problems with uh, the eyes and, and lungs and, and the skin. We don't know in humans. The very first drugs are in humans now, and so we'll see. But from the list that we have accumulated in mouse models, it's, it's really impressive. It's a lot, large list of age-related diseases and phenotypes. Often I try and think about how can we do good in the world, uh, and, and you know, ethical questions that come down to well, what can we do? What sorts of things we can do to have the highest impact, to, to do the sort of most good in a sense? And looking, it, it, sometimes it's abstract and people don't necessarily think that working on science and, you know, and, and engineering can have a, a, a massive effect for good, especially if you're not a scientist, you don't see. Yeah. But um, it does seem as though like the suffering that could be reduced with developing the right kinds of drugs would be enormous. It, 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 would be an enor it would have an enormous impact. If you've ever visited a nursing home, it's full of misery. People who are physically and mentally incapacitated, it would have an enormous impact. I used to work at Knoxville Hostel um, when I was in my early 20s, which is just really? a lot of old people there with yeah. stories to tell and yes. grievances. What, you know, they couldn't feel their hands anymore and yes. they, didn't, yeah. they couldn't remember who, where they were. Yes. They people had taken over their house and things like that. Yeah, yeah. it's scary. It's scary. Yeah. There, there's another reason that this may amuse you why I think it would be good for us to live long, healthy lives. Um, have you read the Tolkien 
trilogy. Do you remember there was a race of creatures called the Ents, and they lived extremely long. And because they lived so long, they were very careful about what they did to the earth. We could learn a few lessons from that. Yeah, the trees, right? They're yes. Always considering, yes. Like, yeah, they're always considering how their impacts, would, how their actions would make an impact in the wider. Because you're going to live a thousand years, yeah. you're going to have to own up to what you did. Well, that that brings up the question of like uh, people often are interested in trying to um, see which cause they should prioritize with. Which should it be environmentalism? Should it be um, anti-nuclear? Should it or anti-nuclear war? Um, should it be like longevity uh, or anti-aging drugs, analytic drugs, or something like that? Um, but it seems as though there's things you can do with analytic drugs which which will help people have longer views. So, have you got anything to say about like maybe the the effects of being around for longer on people's long-term views on humanity and the world around them? I would hope that as people live longer and happier and more aware, meaning their brains were still working properly, um, they would take better care of the earth because they're going to have to live with the consequences of their actions. Um, Tolkien said it's possible. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, Humans are not necessarily very good at taking the long view, but maybe that's because we think of life as being short. Like everything else, when, when something is brand new, uh, first of all, it's hard to predict the future. As you know, the first senolytic drugs were put in humans a very short time ago, and this was just a safety trial just to show that nothing terrible happened. Um, there may be surprises down the road, that will set the field back. We just don't know that. But I, I think if the trajectory continues the way it has been, there's going to be a lot of um, optimism about at least suffering less as you get older. Having your joints work, having your eyesight preserved, having, you know, being able to breathe normally and things like that. I think it's something that's within our grasp. If people make very bold claims about the, the drugs, that, that, that may have a, a negative side effect um, and on, on, in, within the scientific community or outside the scientific community. I, I, I think, I, I do worry about um, overselling the concept. Uh, it, first of all, it's very early days and um, we have a lot to learn, a lot to learn about how best to make these drugs, how to target them properly. We need a lot more than we have currently in our arsenal. I think the um, failure to be uh, modest about expectations can have two effects. It can make the public lose faith in science. This happened a little bit, I think, in California when um, there was big initiative, the stem cell initiative, and I think it was a little bit oversold. There were people who believed that when your child loses his arm, we'll just pour some stem cells on the wound and grow a new arm, and we're nowhere close to that. I think it can also backfire because investors become disen franchised and um, then that slows everything down because it's expensive. Research is, is expensive. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking about that Theranos scandal. Are you aware of that? This blood testing uh, scandal where, where this um, entrepreneur said that they had a device. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yeah. Well, that was... That was a little bit of fraud. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah I, I think, yeah, there's a difference between um, exaggerating and, and outright fraud. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anything like that going on in the, um, this anti-aging community? Do you th are you worried that there's people who start trying to sell snake oil? Oh, they are. They already are selling snake oil. Actually, um, one of my postdocs was at some conference and 
they were handing out these pills that said Senolytics, and <laughs> they were two natural products. Um, they weren't any of the proprietary drugs, but um, yes, there's, but there's always been snake oil. There's always been people who have been promising longevity, if not immortality, that goes back um, thousands of years. And so we shouldn't expect things will change. But as far as real benefits to the, to the public, I think for the first time this is in our grasp. Not immortality, but increased health span. Being health, dying healthier, actually. So there is cause for like excitement, although you know you need to be careful about how you sort of work yes. and how you actually explain these sorts of things. People are getting excited. About they this are. Sort of thing. I I think you know one analogy I sometimes make is with gene therapy, which still I think holds a lot of promise for um, treating a, a number of diseases, not just age-related diseases, but diseases in children and people who are born with, with mutations. Um, and yet, a couple of bad events that happened in the early clinical trials set the field back a decade. And so there is that concern and fear, which is why I think companies who are grounded um, are moving very slowly. No one is claiming that their drug is an anti-aging drug. They're claiming that this drug is going to treat this particular age-related malady. And the hope is, is that that will spread, but the claims have to be kept circumspect right now. This uh, um, aging-related malady seems to be upstream from a lot of diseases, as you mentioned before. It may not be the complete fundamental like, solution, but like, it seems to be a, a fairly sizable piece of the puzzle, would you say? It is. It's a very large piece of the puzzle, but it is not the whole puzzle, for sure. A actually, our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic has done the experiment with mice, a transgenic mouse, of um, removing senescent cells from about middle age until they died. And the mice were healthier, no question. They had an increase in their average lifespan, but no increase in their maximum lifespan. So we know we can't explain all of aging, and we certainly can't explain natural death um, with senescent cells. Has your expectation, has your excitement, uh, or can I say, has your um, credence of the efficacy of senescent um, drugs increased recently because of any, has there been any recent um, experimental data that, that seems quite promising? Actually, there has been a slew of papers in the last less than five years that have shown disease after disease after disease improving, either being prevented or being suppressed, or in a few cases even being reversed by eliminating senescent cells. It exceeded my expectations. And most of this was done in mice, so you have to understand we're still making the connection to humans. but. A lot of it had to do with the fact that there are these transgenic mouse models that have been shared with the academic community. So everyone studying an interesting age-related disease was able to get the mice and then test the idea that senescent cells might drive their particular disease. And the list is growing, still growing. And so it's, it's very impressive. It impressed me, and you know, I was one of the early people who said this might be happening. Wow. How does it feel? It feels great. It feels great. Yeah, I mean, like, just working on abstract problems, the idea that you can work on abstract problems and they actually flourish into massively awesome, suffering reducing things. I don't know how to say it. Although, you know, it, it is interesting because it's difficult to predict how science will go. Very difficult. And so the plea is always to fund research um, 
that gets at basic mechanisms because there are always surprises and the surprises are both ways. So one way, more success than you ever dreamed possible, but failure as well. And we can't predict when we start. So it's a gamble. What first got you into this line of research? What was the motivation? What, what inspired you? How did you get there? I started by studying cancer. It's okay. I was trained as a postdoc as a cancer biologist and it was known at that time that this process of cellular senescence was probably very important for preventing cancer because what cells do is they stop dividing. And a cell that can't divide can't go on and form a tumor. There were another group of people though who kept on um, toying with the idea that this process of stop dividing had something to do with aging. And I actually didn't buy it at first until we began to realize that it was much more complicated than cells stop dividing, that the cells now develop a very complicated way of communicating with the tissue and, and um, allowing molecules to travel throughout the body. And so at that point we began to think seriously that, wow, maybe this does have something to do with aging. And just followed the data. That's what scientists do, is we follow the data. Is there any particular highlights you want to talk about the, the, the recent advances within the last five years, going back to the previous question, that you think is exciting? I think there are two things that uh, are really exciting in, in this um, new era of senolytics. Um, the first is the understanding that senescent cells are not always bad. This is really important because <clears throat> we, like every drug, there's no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. So we're beginning to understand when and where senescent cells are good and when and where they're bad. And that means the drugs are going to have to evolve. They're going to have to become more specific and, uh, and probably even um, uh, maybe less global. That's speculation. The other thing that is exciting is we tend to think of cells as entering a state and all those cells are the same. And now with these modern tools of molecular biology where we can take individual cells and ask what is the pattern of this cell's gene expression compared to this cell's gene expression, we now know that all senescent cells are not alike. So this is a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity to try to see if we can tease out the good one from the bad ones. Again, that will help make better drugs. You're aware of Aubrey de Grey's um, sort of damage repair yes. philosophy, general. Yes, is, yes. Do you, do you agree with that? But pretty much in the sense that a large um, fraction of what we recognize as aging, sorry, a, a large fraction of what we recognize as aging has to do with damage either from the environment or from metabolism, our own metabolism. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that there are things that can cause aging that are independent of damage. This idea that um, not everything can be explained by damage uh, is at the is at the heart of a um, several decades old concept called antagonistic pleiotropy. It was first described in the 1950s by an e by evolutionary biologists, and the two examples of antagonistic pleiotropy um, have very little to do with damage in the classic sense. So one has to do with calcium in your blood. You want calcium in your blood. There are lots of things that calcium is needed for for your cells, and if you break a bone, you want that calcium around to help heal that bone. As you age, that very same calcium, which is good for you when you're young, begins to get into your arteries, and eventually you experience this arterial stiffening, which is a classic hallmark of aging. 
So good for you when you're young, bad for you when you're old. The other example is testosterone. Makes men bigger, stronger, <laughs> and yet if you live long enough and you have testosterone, you will almost 100% develop prostatic hyperplasia and the chance of prostate cancer goes up way high. So again, very good for you when you're in your 20s and 30s, and then in your 50s and 60s, maybe not so good. So I just want to say that it's, it's important not to oversimplify aging. Definitely damage is part of it, and definitely ameliorating damage is going to improve our health span, for sure, maybe our lifespan, we don't know. But it's not always simply due to damage. What are your thoughts on the disease model of, um, I don't know if, yeah, the disease model in um, general health and, and well-being, if it's, if, if there's a disease then it's something to fix, but it's, it, maybe it results in less likely looking at the underlying causes and trying to stop them from getting their own it, It's true. So medicine today is, uh, someone said this and I can't remember who, we don't have health care, we have sick care. It's designed to identify a sickness and then try to fix it. Even those um, illnesses or those pathologies that, uh, where it's important to get at the underlying mechanism, for example, type 2 diabetes, it, by itself it's not harmful, but the side effects um, are, are bad for your health. But even those diseases, physicians tend not to ask questions that are basic enough, like, so why is this person type 2 diabetic? Two people can eat the same amount of sugar and one becomes diabetic, one does not. I'm, I'm not blaming physicians, it's not their fault. We don't have enough science to tell the physicians what they should be looking at. But this is what is so important about modern aging research. For the first time, there's hints that we can get at those basic mechanisms. There's probably more than one. Cell senescence is not the only one. We're pretty sure of that. But we're, we're at the point where we're beginning to get at some of these underlying mechanisms. And then it will take time to then begin to interfere in basic mechanisms as opposed to individual diseases. Yeah, wow. So much to think about. Well, what do you think of the idea of not just trying to treat people for, for being unhealthy, but to make people um, well and even better than well? Yes, of course. People ask me all the time, what do I need to do to live a long, healthy life? And I tell them, you know what to do. Don't smoke, eat your veggies, exercise, choose your grandparents wisely, that's important. Um, we know that, but we also know that humans are flawed creatures. <laughs> so obesity, for example, is, is an epidemic, certainly in some of the developed countries, it's becoming quite serious. And you can tell people to eat less or exercise more, but nonetheless, people become obese. So there, there are some people who think we shouldn't spend our time trying to understand how obesity drives pathology and then developing interventions to overcome what obesity does. I think that's a moralistic stance. I think people are people, but if we understand the basic mechanisms and we have interventions that will allow people to eat what they want but not get obese, why not? In your personal life, when people are asking you, who may not really be aware of what you're doing, like friends or family, how do they respond to what you're doing? Like, do they think, oh, you're crazy, so, you know, you will never be able to sort of um, make people, like old people well? No, they always ask me, when is the next clinical trial and can I sign up? <laughs> I tell them, yeah, I, really, seriously, many of my friends and family, they, they do know what I'm doing. And um, I think they share my optimism. 
but that's probably because they talk to me. Um, but they they are, in, in general, very supportive. I, I have a mother who's 94 years old. She's mostly healthy, except she's now beginning to decline. And my brothers and sister and I watch her, and we think if we can do something to stop that, or at least prevent it, or maybe even reverse it, it would be wonderful, it would be great. She still will die, probably, but she'll die healthy. We want her to die healthy. <laughs>